What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. This is BDGE, Big Dogs Got E Fantasy Football. I am Nicholas. As you can see, I'm not a cop. Today, we're going to talk about some sleepers at the running back position for 2019 fantasy football. As always, if you enjoy the video, make sure you slam that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Uh, I think running back sleepers are as important this year as they've ever been because the way I see a lot of these drafts turning out, there's so much value in the wide receiver position in the middle rounds of the draft, right? What I'm trying to do is escape the first couple rounds with my top RBs, maybe two of the first three, maybe it's just one in the first round and then rack up those those middle rounds of wide receivers because there's just so much value at the position. There's a lot more safety when you're going with wide receivers in rounds two, three, four, five or whatever. And there's a lot of running backs historically that just tend to bust in rounds three through five, probably grab a tight end in that middle round area. Sleepers at the running back positions are probably going to be a really important vital role for 2019 fantasy football. So we're going to look at some guys that are going in the later rounds. So at the end of the day, later rounds, you want upside. And running backs are literally upside when it comes to fantasy football. I'm going to try to keep these all at pick 100 or later. Otherwise, you know, I can go on all day about Rashad Penny and Royce Freeman and Tavius Murray, but they're not really true sleepers. We know that. They're, they're mid-round picks. If you're in a 12-team league, they're like sixth rounders. That being said, if they fall to you, make sure slap that cop button. There will always be sleepers that come out of nowhere. You know, there are the Philip Lindsay's of the world, the Gus Edwards of the world. But in my opinion, there are a few things that you look at when it comes to looking for sleeper running backs that give you the highest probability of hitting, right? Nothing is certainty. There's no black and white. There's always a gray area when it comes to fantasy. Certain players produce in different scoring settings, but I think when you're looking for those upside backs in the later rounds, there are a few traits, you know, whether it's size, whether it's skill set that you look for that I think give you the highest probability of hitting that like workhorse upside. And I think first and foremost, uh, JJ Zacharyson does a really good piece every year about like identifying breakout running backs or sleeper running backs or whatever. And uh, a lot of the way I look at it comes from that article. And I think he actually just dropped his podcast version for the running backs and wide receivers this week. I haven't actually gotten around to listen to it yet, but I'm going to in the coming days and I will link that down below if it did actually come out this week. So I, I would suggest you check that out after I get into this one. First and foremost, you want to look for ambiguous backfields, ones in which the clear cut starter, the workhorse is not in place for the backfield, right? This is super important to help you separate running backs in, in the later rounds that you should draft versus not drafting. And that has a lot to do with like handcuffs versus guys that can actually, you know, overtake their backfield. And in my draft guide, the uh, 2019 Big Dogs Gotta Eat draft guide, which is available right now on bigdogsdraftguide.com. Make sure you go cop that. I have a, an entire top sleepers list broken down by positions of quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers, tight ends. I also have three different sections. I bring this up not to plug it, but just to give you an idea of like what I'm actually talking about. There are, you know, the top sleepers in which I break down very, very, very much in depth like I do in my videos. So I love those guys as sleepers. I think that they are the true cream of the crop of this class when it comes to sleepers. Then there's a section, a second section, right? Guys I like, but I'm not about to do a whole fucking write-up on. You know, I'm not banging on the table for these guys, but I'll mix in some shares across the leagues and it won't surprise me when we look back and we see that a few of these guys hits. So I figured doing mini write-ups on them would help a little bit in the draft guide rather than just giving really in-depth write-ups on like three or four guys. There's probably about six or seven running backs in that that are top sleepers for me. And then there's the last section, right? Those are the first two sections. And there's the if Bloom gets hurt list, right? All these players are going to get a ton of hype. We love Raquel Armstead behind Leonard Fournette. And we love Carlos Hyde and Darwin Thompson behind Damian Williams. But let's be real. There's no fucking chance that those guys make an impact this year in fantasy football without an injury to the guy ahead of him. So we don't draft players based on waiting for an injury, not in redraft, right? You're ra you're wasting roster spots. We want those spots for upside guys, guys who have the chance to overtake those roles in the late preseason and or very early on in the season. So back to the original point, right? We're drafting players in ambiguous backfields. So the starting job, or at least something like a big role, maybe a 50-50 split or 60-40 split is a realistic thing come this start of the year. One of the most important things to look at for running backs, when you're going to the preseason and there's a committee, you want to look at the snap counts that running backs have with the first team offense in these preseason games. Even if, if, the, pre, if the first team offense is running one drive on the first preseason game, you want to see the, splat, the, the snap splits. You want to see if there's one running back taking 100% of those snaps with the first team offense. It's how we knew that C-Mac was the workhorse last year, right? I, myself, I was like, CJ Anderson is going to play a big Big role in this backfield, goal line touches, whatever. It's a very valuable piece of the offense in Carolina there, what we saw with Jonathan Stewart the years prior. As soon as the preseason happened, Christian McCaffrey was taking 95% of the snaps with the first team. So all the analysis I did on CJ Anderson prior to that stuff happening, 
needed to be switched, right? You got to be unbiased with these things. It's how we knew Ronald Jones was not going to be a thing because Peyton Barber was taking 90% of the snaps with the first team. And it's how we knew that Chris Carson was very, very, very much a thing last year, despite everyone saying that it couldn't happen because Rashad Penny had first round draft capital. They split the touches and the snaps with the first team 50-50. That's so important looking at the snap splits with the first team in the preseason. And this is how we can help identify breakout sleeper candidates at the running back position. And building on that, right? It's not like black and white. There's not going to be all these running backs to check all the boxes. Otherwise, they'd probably be starters and they wouldn't be sleepers and everyone would know about them. But the more boxes they check on this list, the better percentage, I think, chance they have of hitting and becoming those sleepers. The second thing you want to look for after ambiguous backfield is a very good offense, right? Obviously, you want a, a team that's good overall or good offense. That goes without saying. And lastly, I'm looking at a guy that has workhorse size. So when he does play himself into that role, if something happens to his counterpart, he's got the size to maintain a, a heavy, heavy workload, right? And then great weight adjusted speed score. So you're basically looking for a three down skill set that can play at an NFL level and is quick, fast, has that breakaway speed in terms of the other NFL players around them. Because that is where the upside lies, my friend. Like, yes, there can be a slow or small running back take over a backfield, but their upside is not that of a workhorse. Think of Marlon Mack last year, right? Great offense in the Colts. Very ambiguous backfield entering the year. We didn't know what they were going to do with Naeem Hines. We didn't know what they were going to do with Jordan Wilkins. But if you look at Marlon Mack, his athletic profile is far, far above those other two. He was a great pass catcher back in college. Obviously hasn't transferred over to the NFL, but he had a great year last year. His weight adjusted speed score, he's 215 pounds. So it's not huge, but it's definitely good enough size to be a workhorse in the NFL. 76 percentile for weight adjusted speed score. That's just one example, but that's how you knew that. Like David Johnson was probably the back to own in the Arizona backfield a couple of years ago when he was competing with like Andre Ellington, who's a scat back. David Johnson, the workhorse, breakaway, speed, score, size. Like, that's the stuff that you need to know in the preseason going forward. That's why you're going to know about the first guy up on this list. Before we do that, let's hit the intro. Jalen Samuels of the Pittsburgh Steelers, currently going after pick 100. He's like 101, running back 42. I've talked a lot about Jalen Samuels. He is one of the running backs in my sleeper list, in my draft guide right now. He's massive, right? Six foot, 225 pounds. He runs a 4.54 40 yard dash. Puts him in the 82nd percentile for weight adjusted speed score. He does not lack in burst or agility, but the main thing to point out here, and I can't show you guys this enough, is his college target share, 97th percentile. He saw 20.2% of the targets while he was at NC State. He is a passing down savant. And if there's one thing the Steelers are going to need this year to replace Antonio Brown's 170 targets, it is just that, a passing down weapon. Samuels played a total of 39 snaps through week 12 last year. In 2018, 39 total snaps. But James Conner started battling injuries, as he's done for two years in a row now. Samuels stepped up in a big way. In the three games that Conner missed from weeks 14 to 16, Samuels saw 18, 21, and 15 touches. 18 touches a game, caught four passes a game, averaged nearly 110 total yards from scrimmage per game. That includes a monster 172-yard game against the Patriots. Now, Conner returned in week 17, and Samuels took a back seat in the rushing workload which was not unsurprising. Connor carried the ball 14 times. Samuels only carried the ball, I believe it was two times. But, but Samuels out-targeted Connor 8-2-3. Jay Sam, as we're going to call him going forward, Jay Sam, finished the year with 26 receptions. As I said, he only played 39 snaps through week 12. He finished the year with 26 receptions on 29 targets. Those 26 receptions were more than Lamar Miller, Mark Ingram, Chris Carson, Jordan Howard, Adrian Peterson, Marlon Mack, Derrick Henry had in the entirety of 2018, despite Samuels playing on 20.8% of the Steelers' snaps last year. He's a phenomenal pass catcher, like I said, and if there's one facet of James Conner's game that I think could use improvement, it is that. Conner is not very athletic. I don't see him as someone who's going to force the defense to focus in on him on all three downs. Connor is a grinder. Realistically, he's a bully with a potential for highlight plays. He makes some really nice plays. He caught 55 passes last year on 71 targets, which was a 13% lower catch rate than Samuels posted. Connor also had four drops last year, which was the seventh highest total among all running backs. So while the end of the season numbers look good for Connor, right? 51 receptions, that's great. He was far from efficient with that volume and far less efficient than what a guy like Samuels, in my opinion, would bring to the table if given the same opportunity. Now, we are having to bank on, I mean, we saw the, the week 17 sample size where he out-targeted Connor eight to three, but 
you know, it's a one game sample size. I'm not going to go nuts over that. So we're really realistically banking on the Steelers coaching staff to recognize this opportunity and recognize that Samuel should be utilized way more in the passing game. And what that does is once you get a guy on third downs, right, he becomes a third down back. Sometimes you're going to use him in the running game instead of the passing game. So he's going to get a mix of touches. And if you start looking good on third down in the passing game and on the ground, you are eventually going to start working your way into early down work as well. Maybe goal line work. You never know. But that's the first step in order to start eating into a workload. So again, I I relay that it's going to come down to the Steelers coaching staff recognizing that Samuel should earn more of this opportunity. Why am I confident in that happening? Because the hire that they made this offseason, they bring in a guy named Eddie Faulkner who is taking over as their running backs coach. Prior to joining the Steelers, this guy, Eddie Faulkner, spent six years from 2013 to 2018 at North Carolina State University, NC State. Guess who else went there? Jalen Samuels did. Faulkner was the tight ends fullback special teams coordinator there. Jalen Samuels played running back slash tight end at NC State. If there's anyone that knows how to use Samuels' skill set and will advocate to have Samuels in on any passing downs and just use him as a weapon overall, it is literally this guy. Samuels caught 200 over 200 balls in his college career. That's a lot of balls for a guy who's not a wide receiver. Bottom line, right? Jalen Samuels is a great pass catcher in an offense losing 169 targets from AB and then another 40 from Jesse James, who is who was a tight end last year. But we're talking about Jalen Samuels as if he is only a pass catcher, right? As if he's the James White to this Pittsburgh offense. But again, Jalen Samuels is a workhorse in terms of his size. 225 pounds, six feet tall. So he can handle the load. And that's what we saw when Connor was out. So they obviously trust him to do that. They didn't really use a running back by committee. So is he going to come into the year and battle Connor for workhorse touches right away? Absolutely not, right? It's Connor's job to lose. But what are the chances of Connor being out? I don't really know. He finished his rookie season on the IR after messing up his MCL. That was an MCL that he tore in college as well and needed surgery on it. Last year, he missed three games, the ankle issue at the end of the year, as I stated already. And I don't know how cancer works, to be quite honest with you, but it's possible that someone who, you know, courageously fought through cancer might have less stamina and durability towards the end of the year, right? Your cells might be a little bit weakened overall after going through so much. And then towards the end of the year, weeks 13, 14, 15 come and your body is starting to wear down. And I think that's kind of what we saw last year. And that's what might have led to the ankle injury. And that's what might have led to what happened at the end of his rookie year and what might have led to that happening when he was in college and towards MCL. Maybe it's coincidence. Maybe it's not. We'll have to see what Dr. Jesse Morse says about James Conner. He's doing like 40 or 50 individual injury write-ups and giving a rating on, you know, one to 10, what their injury risk for 2019 is. That's in the, uh, that's exclusive to the Big Dogs Draft Guide. So again, another reason to cop that on BigDogsDraftGuide.com. Really looking forward to see what he says about James Conner. He hasn't given me that right up yet, but it wouldn't surprise me whatsoever if we saw James Conner miss a portion, if not, you know, more time than that this year. And Jalen Samuels, like if Jalen Samuels fills in and, you know, breaks out again, like he did last year, it's going to end up being a running back by committee, which is why I am a little bit nervous about a guy like James Conner in the back half of the first round or early second round, because I don't think he has as big of a leash as, as a lot of people think, because he has a guy like Jalen Samuels behind him. So Samuels is a guy you're getting after pick 100 that I think has immense, immense, immense upside. Let's move to the second running back on this list. Before we do that, I want to give you guys a little commissioner tip. If you're a commissioner in one of your leagues, whether it's your friends, family, or work league, this is something that I use personally in all my leagues. I'm the commissioner of like five different leagues. Teamstake.com is like the, it's basically PayPal or Venmo for fantasy football leagues specifically, or any fantasy league. It doesn't have to be football in general, but it's a way to collect all of the league's buy-ins without an issue, right? So rather than collecting cash and PayPal and Venmo from your friends and having them all throw it in like all over the place, you literally go on teamstake.com, make an account and sign up your league. You're not transferring your league over from like Yahoo or ESPN. You're literally just signing up a league on there. And then you just throw a URL out to your friends. If they're like, oh, you know, I'm going to drop off the cash later at your house or I'm going to PayPal or Venmo you. So you say, nope, you, you, you fucking give them that Dikembe finger wag and then you throw the URL at them. Okay. The teamstake URL that you'll get straight from teamstake.com, sign up. Have your friends buy in through that and you can set it up to be completely customizable. However, you want payouts, first place, second place, third place, gets a share, Um, most points, regular season, most points each week or whatever. It's really, really, really customizable. You can have it so it carries over to the next year. If you're in a dynasty league, you want to pay a little bit upfront for the following year so people don't leave. That's a really good little tip that I like to use in most of my dynasty leagues. Don't have to pay for the service. When you sign up at teamstake.com, it's completely free to use. There are plenty of options to deposit and get payouts that are also free to use. So realistically, you are not paying for this, but it is an incredible service that I use in my leagues as well. So I promise you, you are not going to regret signing up on teamstake.com. Thank you all 
yourself for sponsoring the video. If you are the commissioner, use it. If you are in a league and your friend is the commissioner, tell them to sign up. It'll make your league a lot more efficient and it's there. It's signed up for forever and you guys could keep using it as the buying. So thank you, teamstake.com. Let's move over to another one of the sleepers on my list. And I was trying to decide which of like the six or seven I have in the draft guide to throw in here. I went with Malcolm Brown of the Los Angeles Rams, running back 66 right now, overall 184 is ADP. I've been scooping him up in like almost every single best ball draft in like the 15th, 16th round. Because if you've watched any of my videos, you know I am very, 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 very vocal about my concern for Todd Gurley this year and his arthritic knee. The knee is going to act up at one point or another for Todd Gurley. And when it does, it's not going to be only the Darrell Henderson show. It is going to be the Darrell Henderson and the Malcolm Brown show. And to be honest, disrespectful how far Malcolm Brown is dropping in drafts right now, considering how early Darrell Henderson is starting to creep up. Malcolm Brown last year was having an efficient year before he was placed on the IR in week 13. He was averaging 4.9 yards per carry behind Todd Gurley, suffered a broken collarbone versus Detroit. And the timetable for his return was eight to 10 weeks. So at the very latest, at the end of March, which was three months ago, he was fully healed. So we're not worried about the injury that put him on the IR at all. They let all world meatball CJ Anderson walk. The Rams assigned an original tender to Malcolm Brown because they wanted to get him back on their team. After he was assigned an original tender by the Rams, the Lions came in and hit him with an offer sheet in which the Rams were like, nah, son, you ain't getting Malcolm the God Brown from us. So they actually signed him to a bigger deal. Two years, a little bit over $3 million. So they ensured that he remained on their roster. They they like Malcolm Brown a lot. And people who want to believe that Daryl Henderson will occupy a workhorse role if Gurley's knee becomes a, a ting are just are just wrong, man. Henderson is 5'8", 208 pounds. Those are not workhorses in the NFL. Brown, when you look at him, is far closer to Todd Gurley in stature than Henderson is and will be the Mark Ingram basically to, you know, you hear all the reports about Daryl Henderson is going to be the Alvin Kamara in this offense. If Curly misses time, Malcolm Brown is going to be Mark Ingram in this offense. And even if Brown isn't as heavily involved in the passing game as we've, you know, become accustomed to see Todd Gurley be, an early down or a goal line role is ridiculously valuable in this Los Angeles Rams, like, high-powered offense. The Rams have scored 30.8 points per game and 28.9 points per game over the last two seasons, respectively, ranking second and third in scoring in the entire NFL. And more specific to Brown's role, Todd Gurley has seen 18 goal line carries in each of the past two seasons. So that's 36 overall. That ranks first among all NFL players in that span. And that was just 29 games. He hasn't played the full 16 games each season. So he's getting 1.25 goal line carries a game. He's basically getting a scoring opportunity every single game. And that is what Malcolm Brown is going to see if he takes Cod Gurley's place. And Gurley's led the NFL in red zone carries and in carries inside the 10-yard line in each of the past two seasons as well. It should come as no surprise that 30 rushing scores leads all NFL running backs over that same time span, and it's not even remotely close. So nothing about this LA Rams offense says that it's going to slow down. McVay still has the troops in order. They will be high-powered again. Brown might end up being irrelevant to the Rams' success in 2019. Completely a uh, possibility if they treat Todd Gurley's knee as they should and really lowers workload, and then they mix Brown in with Henderson, and they all get you know no more than eight touches a game or something like that. That's completely possible. But the fact that Brown is going all the way at pick 184, you're getting him in like the last rounds of the draft. I think he's a much better investment than Gurley in the second or third, and Henderson in the fifth or sixth. So Brown is the guy that I'm most likely to have the most shares of in this backfield. A couple other guys that I like that I'm going to run through kind of quickly. We have Ido Smith of the Atlanta Falcons. I know he didn't look great last year, but even, but just going back to college, he was such a great natural pass catcher. He was in the 88th percentile in terms of college target share. And this projects to be an elite offense behind an RB in Devonta Freeman, who has dealt with a ridiculous number of serious injuries over the last two years, whether it's MCLs, PCLs, concussions, he has tons of concussions. And head coach Dan Quinn already came out and said that this offseason, Ido Smith is going to see a significant increase in his touch totals in 2019. So I think he's going to take over as the actual pass catching back in this offense if they do end up throwing to the running backs enough. And there's a very high risk of injury for Devonta Freeman. So I think he has standalone value as well as some upside if something were to happen to Freeman. So I like Ido Smith. Talk about Deion Lewis. I think he is so underrated. Derrick Henry is still not going to catch passes there. As much as I am actually getting a little bit more friendly towards the idea of Derrick Henry in the fourth, maybe the late third round, Deion Lewis is still the pass catcher there. He had 59 receptions last year. 
even when Derrick Henry took over and was like the workhorse down the stretch, Deion Lewis remained heavily involved in the passing game, right? He averaged nearly four receptions a game over the Titans' last six games. So even when Henry was that guy, Lewis was still on pace for 60 to 65 receptions. I think he's gonna easily catch another 50 plus balls and then get 100 plus carries on his own. So Lewis is someone that I could see being so, so valuable in PPR leagues, but completely being slept on. Then we have the Tampa Bay Bucks backfield between Ronald Jones and Peyton Barber. And this is going to be one, an interesting one that you're going to have to monitor. Like I said, preseason snaps is going to be a big indicator of where they actually believe Ronald Jones to be. We're hearing all the hype about how, you know, Ronald Jones is just a new player and every, everyone is saying he looks so good. If we get to the first or second preseason game, which is in like a month from now, which is fucking amazing. And uh, Peyton Barber takes 75% of the snaps with the first team. You got to be off Ronald Jones. I'm telling you, but all reports out of camp, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, beat reporters, coaches, players are all saying Ronald Jones looks good. So it's very possible that that happened. You know, he came in as the youngest running back in that class last year. It's very possible. He just wasn't ready. Wasn't, wasn't ready for what the NFL actually hit him with. And this year he takes things a lot more seriously. That being said, Bruce Arians coming in, this offense should be a lot more efficient. And Barber was also super underrated for what he did last year. He did not score a lot of rushing touchdowns, but that's going to be volatile. Um, and when there's an offense that's more efficient and they're getting more goal line looks, and Barber is clearly the bigger back in this offense. So he's going to be the goal line back, probably not Ronald Jones. If he ends up finishing with, with eight to 10 touchdowns this year, I would not be surprised whatsoever. And there was beat reports out of Tampa Bay that were saying that uh, Barber's way more likely to finish with more yards than Ronald Jones is. And he's way more likely to finish with more touchdowns, no matter how you look at it. So Barber, the fact that he's going like six rounds after Ronald Jones is someone I would much rather have on my team at this point. Last guy uh, I'll quickly get into is Damian Harris of the New England Patriots. I feel like the Patriots wouldn't just waste a third round pick on a guy like Damian Harris without intention behind it, given the fact that they just used a first round pick last year on Sony Michelle. You know, we're well aware of Sony Michelle's knee issues, but I think this goes beyond just depth. Probably spells bad news for Rex Burkhead, who brings a similar skill set and like versatile skill set, which is definitely why they value Damian Harris to the backfield. And Damian Harris is just bigger. So if you could bring the same skill set with more size, you're probably more equipped to, you know, take on a major role in the NFL. Something that I've brought up as well. Sonny Michel, not only has he had that knee act up already this offseason, right? He's, he's gone in for a scope, but he also had a lot of fumbling issues coming into the NFL last year. So if he fumbles the ball, moves into the doghouse, Damian Harris starts taking over some of those early down carries, plays well, like he could certainly move right into that role pretty quickly. So these are all guys, obviously, at the very ends of your draft. So it's hard to get super, super excited about them. But if you're looking for more running back depth, your pass pick 100, your pass pick 125, I think a lot of these guys have the size, the skill set, the versatility, and uh, their backfields are, are pretty ambiguous, if you ask me. So they hit a lot of those check marks. That's all I got for today's running back sleeper videos. If you want the full list and the very in-depth breakdown of all the sleepers that I have, again, you can go check that out on www dot bigdogsdraftguide.com. The guide launched on July 1st. It has very, 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 very good reviews coming my way. Um, for anyone that's copped it so far, thank you for any of the reviews you have left. If you did and you've been enjoying it, make sure you uh, drop a comment down below letting the other people know that it's a good guide and it will very much help them. It'll be the only thing they need for the 2019 fantasy football season realistically. If you enjoyed the video, found it informational, you can go to my channel and check out the other videos I've been put, putting out all summer long. Make sure you smash that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel if you are new, and I will see you tomorrow's Fade the Public. We got a good one for you. We're doing a super flex mock draft. So I'll see you then. Peace.